Rejoice, Tottenham fans. Antonio Conte is your new manager as he replaces Nuno Espirito Santo. Conte, who signs the deal until 2023, has an option to extend a lot to discuss with James Bench, including the Italians' return to the Premier League and possibly another return from Unai Emery and Newcastle. But first, Antonio Conte, and we will discuss this and much more with James Bench. Que Golazo begins right now. Everybody, welcome to Que Go Lasso. Thank you so much for being part of the show. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Que Go Lasso Pod. Listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. Please leave a five-star rating and review. We're youtube.com forward slash Que Go Lasso. We're so close to 4,000 subscribers, James Bench. So close to that. So please, please make sure that you keep subscribing. Press that notification bell to get all the latest episodes, including this one, which is somewhat of an emergency of an episode. It's always important, definitely, when James Bench is in the house. James Bench, how are you, my friend? Uh, I am. I'm great. Uh, it, as we're speaking now, it's still quite a few hours to go until Champions League kickoff. So this is shaping up to be a, um incredibly long day, but a really exciting day, especially if you're a Tottenham fan. I think uh, everyone that watches this video or listens to us regularly knows that neither of us are. So I think if you're not a Tottenham fan, it's quite a, quite a stressful time because you're about to see one of the best managers in the world entering this league and uh, showing what he can do with a with a squad that's still got a lot of talent in it. I mean, I don't know what you think about Antonio Conte, but this is an almighty coup for Spurs, in my view. 100%. And we're going to discuss that uh, this very moment as Antonio Conte returns to the Premier League. Of course, the former Chelsea manager, he did great things by winning the Premier League in his first season, but it's not just about Chelsea, all the things he did with Juventus as well as Italy. So we will discuss that. A few uh, things here. Obviously, this has been reported for a little bit of a while now, courtesy, of course, our very own Fabrizio Romano and uh, James Bench adding a very, very good piece that you should read on CBSSports.com. What to expect uh, if you're a Tottenham fan from Antonio Conte. But I'm with you, James Bench. This is a win for Tottenham and uh, you know, we'll get to it in a second. A loss for other clubs, I think. Just a little bit on the statement, by the way, uh, Antonio Conte mentioning why it didn't happen this past summer. Because if you remember, before Nuno Espirito mm -hmm. Santo, Antonio Conte was in the running, of course. Uh, but he said, last summer, our union did not happen because the end of my relationship with Inter Milan was still too recent and emotionally too involved with the end of the season. So I felt that it wasn't yet the right time to return to coaching. So now he is here. He has promised uh, the, the keys to the castle. James Bench, talk to me about Antonio Conte and his return to the Premier League and Tottenham. How good is this for the Premier League and Tottenham? I mean, for the Premier League, it's fantastic. For Tottenham, it's even better. I'm not sure I'm buying that statement. You know, everything I heard over yeah. the summer was that it was, this was a question of transfer budgets and how much could be spent and whether, and I suppose this is the one bit that, that maybe Conte said without saying in his statement, whether a better job might become available, uh, maybe the Man United job, which to be fair, it looked like kind of the, the links were going cold there. And then from what I'm told, you know, obviously this looks like it happened very quickly, but actually even before that defeat to Manchester United, um, there were initial conversations sounding out whether Conte would be interested. I think Tottenham were very conscious that Man United were there in the background looking at a new manager and that Conte is the best man on the market. And I mean, of that, there can be, to my mind, no doubt. I look at this manager and say, has he, he has improved every club that he has taken over. I think he has exceeded expectations at every club that he's taken over. I mean, you know, we've saw that last season with the Inter Milan, really fantastic force. And it took something special to knock Juventus off the, the perch uh, in, in Serie A. And don't forget, that was a perch that Conte put them on. He took that team from seventh to first in one season. And it wasn't a great team. Uh, it, it was, you know, some quite ordinary players. Alessandro Matri reading, leading the line. He took Chelsea, and I know they'd come off a freak season under Jose Mourinho, but he took them to champions when no one believed they would win the title, beating the likes of Guardiola, Pochettino, Klopp, Wenger, possibly yeah. the most competitive. Guardiola's uh, first season in the Premier League as yeah, well. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, I was looking back on that, and I think it maybe is the time when the Premier League was at its apex of competitiveness, when actually going into the season, you could have picked six teams that might have had a ch shout of winning the title, and, and he steamrolled the field. Um, I mean, again, we can talk about this more. The football he plays when it's attacking is a dream to watch I loved that Chelsea and I you know no Chelsea fan me but I loved watching that Chelsea team in his first season you know they stretched the pitch wide 
Marcus Alonso and Victor Moses devastating as as wingers. And I think that will all fit Tottenham quite nicely. I mean, the big question, and I love this tweet from from Tom Williams, this is either going to be, you know, this is either the perfect moment for Antonio Conte to overpower everything that Tottenham is, to turn them into winners, or it's the perfect moment for Tottenham to absolutely ruin Antonio Conte, the serial winner, and prove that even he can't do it with Tottenham. (laughs) <laughs> so it's one way or the other, which I think is a fair assessment just because of the way that we have seen Tottenham as of late. To be fair, to be fair, this, uh, I think, was in the cards, not necessarily Conte coming in, but just the fact that what did you expect from Nuno Espirito Santo when he came into this job? It was always going to be this sort of reactive football, defensively minded. So it was never going to be a success. But now I think... Uh, would you say, James, that, you know, before we get into the dynamics of it and the statistics and just how Conte is going to be with Tottenham, do you think that, you know, obviously the, the Daniel Levy aside, Fabio Paratici, I think, is is the one really that that, that has created this uh, tremendous 180 and also will be really the middleman between anything that could happen that might go wrong in the future? Yeah, I think that's very significant because when we look at you know, what goes wrong with Conte, it is usually about that boardroom relation. I was going back for my piece and, you know, everyone remembers at Juventus falling out because he didn't get Cuadrado and Sanchez, mm. the real ructions in that second season at um, at Chelsea. But even at Inter Milan, within a matter of months, he was calling for directors to come out and defend him. Now, you know, that may well happen with Paratici, but it, it's a buffer between him and Levy. And we know that Levy can have great, great relations with managers and he cannot. Um, you know, in the end, it's also, we should remember, this is what Paratici was hired to do. It was right. when they thought they might get Conte, they went and got Paratici to strengthen their hand there. And, um, you know, if we briefly talk about Nino, I feel really sorry for the guy in the end. I mean, he was the eighth, ninth, tenth choice. Yeah. How, whatever number you put it on. Uh, he took over a, a squad that knew that. A, he's had a star player come back in in Harry Kane who is just not, I, I, I know this is a, a thing that will really upset footballers if they hear it. He's just not working hard enough. You know, I was there on, on Saturday and, you know, I joked about it in my piece, but you could genuinely forget that Harry Kane was on the pitch. He was diabolical and he's been really, really poor this season. So, you know, Nuno was on a hiding to nothing. I think Conte changes a lot of that because, you know, if Kane wants his move, he's going to have to play well. Um, but also Conte's coming in here with with a level of power, a level of respect and a level of autonomy that, that Nuno never had. And certainly I think he'll find it easier because of that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if we focus just on Harry Kane for a second, uh, the things that Romelu Lukaku has said about Antonio Conte are very, very significant, how he turned him into a winner, etc. cetera. Uh, our producer, Des Norris, and I were talking about Diego Costa in that first season as well with Chelsea, <laughs> right? Uh, so, you know, there you either go, you, you are, listen, here's the thing about Antonio Conte. I think more than any manager, you're either with him, like literally with him. And if you're not, get out of the door. You, you, I think you mentioned in your piece as well, that when Thierry Henry was interviewing him and saying, you know, uh, you know I'll, I'll, if they're not with me, if they're not performing to what I want, I prefer them dead. And Thierry Henry started laughing, thinking, ah, what a funny joke. Not, Conte was not joking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, he he looks like he looks like he could kill you if he needed to, which I think is going to help Tottenham, I think. All right. So let's talk about the system from Antonio Conte for a second. Before we get into that, uh, you were mentioning some of his previous clubs and achievements. By the way, I'm just looking over here as well. Everything that he did, you know, uh, with Juventus, it was, uh, you know, nearly as uh, let me see here. Yeah, it was nearly a 70 percent win ratio with Italy. Not a very good Italy side. Uh, he did tremendous things. He did nearly a 60% uh, percent win ratio. Chelsea, 65% percent win ratio, winning the title, of course, and as well with Inter Milan, which is a 62% percent win ratio. A winner is just the ultimate thing that you get from him. But from the system and what you think he can implement with this specific squad, right? Not just Harry Kane, not just Human Son, but I'm thinking specifically about other players that could really benefit from, you know, the favoured 3-5-2 formation. He has played around, but 3-5-2 is the one that you would think James Bencher uh, is going to be the one that he's going with Tottenham? Yeah, just because it looks quite a nice mix for the players that are there. I mean, you know, I was he does, he, I think his favourite formation, and um, maybe I'll try and ask him about this at some stage. I think he really likes playing 4 2 4, which mm. he played in Siena. He tried at Chelsea. He tried very early on at Juventus, but obviously 
it's it can be a bit kamikaze and the players have to be very good you know your wingers have to be very good at pressing but anyway yeah three five two three four three however he sets it up i mean you mentioned the top two you've got a kane son strike partnership if they're playing well you're absolutely golden there nothing to worry about um Reg- Reguion will be excellent I think as a left wing back I don't know as much about Emerson um, some of his passing of late has been dreadful but got, he put in a very good cross as well for Mora then Hoiberg feels like a really solid um, sitting midfielder and potentially you could partner him with both Le Celso and um, Undombele which I, would really enhance Spurs' ability to get up the someone I think Conte will love as well oh yeah yeah I think if those players I mean Ndombele is an intriguing one because clearly you know there's something that that Mourinho hasn't liked that Pochettino hasn't has doubted that Ryan Mason as well and you could even say Nuno who was in and out of the team so you know if Ndombele can grasp this and say this is a fresh start anyone that watches the Premier League will know he is one of the most exhilarating players to watch and he could be the the, the the player that makes this sing. You know, he could be like a Nicolo Barella. He could be maybe like a, a more rangy Cesc Fabregas. Um, you know, he could be the the heart of this team. Yeah. If, but equally, you know, as you were saying just then, Luis, uh, if, um, you know, if, if he doesn't put his head down on day one, he is not playing at all. Um I mean, Des has also asked about January transfers. They've got to be looking at centre-back, surely. Romero's great. Tanganga could be quite useful. I think he'd be good in a three. Uh, Eric Dyer, kind of what it says on the tin now, isn't it? Dyer. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's uh, probably, you think he would look into Serie A to bring in some talent from there as well, specifically, because of, uh, specifically the centre-back positioning. I think that's where I'm focusing more in January, I think defensively because when you're looking at Tottenham right now ninth in the Premier League but they have conceded 16 goals 16 Let goals him. you know that's that's a lot okay very basic errors again yeah. I mean, against United this was you know I mean I, I was writing about this from a United perspective it was um the chances they were giving up the chances United were getting were mostly because of mistakes by Spurs by Ben yeah. Davis or or by um Dyer or, or anyone else yeah it's interesting that they when Mourinho was in charge, they there were pretty pretty strong interest in Milan Skriniar at, at Milan, uh, at Inter, sorry. Um, and I wonder if that could be one to go back in for, you know, I th- I'm sure that there are still financial issues at, at Inter and obviously, you know, Conte knows Skriniar well. That that to me seems like one where this is, you know, no reporting behind this, just spitballing, but it, that seems like an interesting one. Mm. Um, otherwise, do they go for, he always signs Victor Moses. You know, I don't know where <laughs> he is, is right now, but you know, bat signal has gone up for him. He is, uh, he's going to be no doubt linked. Yeah. I think reportedly he's been offered a pretty big, uh, you know, uh, budget here for January as well. That's what we're hearing, right? Well, yeah. I mean, don't know where the money's coming from, but that's it, apparently exactly. what's happening. I mean, let's not forget, you know, I mean, obviously Spurs have a great money printing machine in the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, fantastic stadium, (laughs) Um, but they've only had it open for for three, four months. And I mean, you know, I'm doing my first conference league game there in a while on Thursday. Um, I don't expect it. Well, maybe it'll be full now, but, you know, they're not raking in huge, huge funds. So like maybe, but maybe you are now planning to sell Kane? Maybe, maybe. I mean, listen, I think the biggest point about that one is nobody's doubting Harry Kane's talents. How how could you? It's Mm. more about if he still wants to leave Tottenham and Antonio Conte, if he is one thing is if you're not with me, bye. Like that, there's no, there's no middle ground here. There's no gray area. And I think that that's going to be the conversation that he has with Harry Kane. All right, let's, let's talk about the immediate needs because Antonio Conte now is officially the manager of Tottenham. Let's talk about these next few fixtures for Spurs, by the way. The first one is away at Everton and a Rafa Benitez, by the way, that is also, you know, in a spot of bother, as they say, Uh, obviously losing to Wolves. They're not doing very well as well. As we look at the table as well, they're 10th. So it's, you know, only one point beyond Tottenham. So that's a big one. And then, if you just maximize it a little, then on Sunday, they have Leeds, then Burnley, and then Brentford. Uh, what do you make of those fixtures and how Antonio Conte can, you know, rectify a few things against them? It's favorable, isn't it? There's nothing there. There's nothing there that will 
really put the pressure on. And maybe it also means that after these first few games, the spotlight dims on him a little bit. I mean, I suppose the other thing to mention is there are still two Europa Conference League games. Right. This is one of the things I'm really intrigued by. We know that Antonio Conte is not a coach that loves European competitions. Again, you know, I was looking at when he's balancing that with a domestic season, because you can almost park that Europa League run um, with Inter in 2020, because it was all after the season was over. The only time he's gone deep was the Europa League with um, Juventus. But curiously, I get the feeling Spurs would be absolutely delighted to be out of the Conference League, you know. Yeah, and I think Conte too. I think my initial reaction is he's really just going to put in the kids in the conference. He's going he's to give, because he just wants to prioritise mm. climbing up this table. And I mean, Nuno was doing the exact same thing. And I mean, right. I think as it stands, they're third in the table. So, right. um, I mean, that's his first game as well, though, is is the Conference League game against Vitesse. Um, I think they've not sort of confirmed whether or not he'll be in the dugout but for that, but we're talking two days out, so I don't see why he wouldn't be. Right. Um, does he kind of also, though, want to make a really fast start? No one wants to start by losing to pretty ordinary opposition in their first game in charge. So I'm... Um, you know, I'm super intrigued by that conference league game, which you can watch on Paramount Plus. There you go. Well, speaking of European qualification, I just wanted to talk about the objectives for Tottenham, the overall season's objectives. It's ta- if Tottenham can't win a title with Antonio Conte, should just they give up on the idea and, f- and focus more on hosting more NFL games instead? There's <laughs> Norris. You're so mean. I'm trying to be more serious here. But he has a point, right? Uh, what's Antonio's con- Antonio Conte's objective, do you think, this season with Tottenham coming in November? does Is he the kind of manager you think that he says, you know what? Okay, we're ninth. That's fine. 15 points. But really, that's 10 points. 10 points from first. It's not impossible to really dream. What do you think? Well, yeah. But the teams that are, the teams that are first, second, and third are quite a lot better than Tottenham. Right. So what's the what's his objective then? Do you think Champions Fourth. League qualification? Fourth. I think you he yeah. immediately you kind of now have to almost expand that bubble of teams that are fighting for fourth. I mean, Man United could really have appointed Conte, and I think ended a lot of this conversation. And I think they're going to live to regret this, mm. especially as it looks like they will just carry on with Solskjaer. So I think now you put Spurs in a group with West Ham, Man United, uh, Tottenham, Arsenal, I'd like to say, um, as, no, the, as, the, con- as the contenders for top four. Yeah. Um, and, I, I, you know, Daniel Levy and Paratici will be smart enough to know that there's no guarantees with this squad that that, that team finishes top four. But, you know, it'll be about signs of progress. Maybe as much as it's not Conte's way, he's a league manager. Maybe he goes hard at the FA Cup because the other thing is, this, you know, that this team does really want to win silverware. I know that Pochettino wasn't that bothered about the FA Cup, wasn't that bothered about the EFL Cup. But there's some great players here that want to win trophies with Tottenham that have had great histories with Tottenham. And I think the FA Cup, the EFL Cup now, I think no, they, they are. are Antonio to. Conte will treat those with the utmost respect simply because I think he will respect the fact that he's returning to the Premier League and understands, to your point, that Tottenham want to win silverware. And I think that the FA Cup, even the League Cup, I think things like that will be very important to him. Also, I think that arriving in November is kind of helpful as opposed to him arriving towards, I don't know, say mid-December, right? When it's like, oh, crunch time. I got the January transfer window opening up. So there's a little bit of a window. Um, All right, before we wrap up Antonio Conte, because we do have another segment on Unai Emery. Ultimately, let's just give me a, give me a, a gut reaction here. Antonio Conte is a Tottenham manager. What do you make of Tottenham as we look into May? Where are they? I mean, they've got the sixth, seventh best squad and the somewhere between first and third best manager. I really like Antonio Conte. I think maybe he's, yeah, he's the third best manager in the league um, and that can win you a lot of games because we've yeah. seen he, he, do, he can do a lot with... Not that much. The chances of them getting Champions League for next season has significantly improved. Antonio Conte is the new manager of Tottenham Hotspur. We're going to take a break when we come back. More managers uh, with the rotation coming in and out of the Premier League as Unai Emery leads the race to manage Newcastle United. Diego Lasso, James Bench, we'll be right back. 
Welcome back, everybody, to Kigo Lasso with James Bench. Uh, James Bench, Newcastle United, the richest club in the world, are also possibly the richest club in the championship very soon, unless they really turn it around. I mean, Newcastle fans can get mad all they want. Uh, the truth is right there. They lost pitifully against Chelsea. No shame in that, but they really were poor 19th zero wins conceded 23 goals only scored 11 six losses four draws four points we know what's happening here with newcastle and right now the leader we thought it was gonna be paulo fonseca for a long time but now who is it james bench it's unai emery back in the premier league talk to me about this Uh, so you know we're speaking now uh about half past one UK time. Um, I can't remember what that is Eastern time anymore. Thank you. Uh, clock's going back. 9.30 a.m. Eastern New York time, but yes, Tuesday. Tuesday morning, Eastern New York and Tuesday afternoon in Europe and the UK. So thanks to Luis for getting up so early to chat with me. <laughs> um, I sort of, you know, my understanding of the situation as, as of this time is that negotiations are progressing rapidly and effectively. They are not concluded yet. It is not necessarily a given that Unai Emery will be the next manager, but it is now increasingly likely that he will take over at Newcastle. Um, the reports on the Northeast um, and, and information I've heard from a more Newcastle side is that they really would like to get this done in time for Saturday's game against Brentford. Um, wow, it, is a, it is a surprise move, uh, perhaps a surprise move from Unai Emery's side. And I'm sure that the Champions League game they've got coming up this midweek will potentially slow things down a little bit. Um, I think the expectation is still he'll be in the dugout for that, but this could change rapidly. It could even change by the time this is published. Um, This is, you know, there have already been conversations about transfer targets for January, which gives you a sense of how real this is. Should anything fall apart, Eddie Howe would be the likely contender, the next one up. Um, It's not quite done yet, but right now it seems like Unai Emery, former Arsenal and, uh, PSG manager is going to be the new Newcastle United manager. Unbelievable. I have so many questions. Before I do that, I just want to say something to all fans out there, specifically Newcastle. Not all of you, but just some of you. If you judge Unai Emery on his record, fine. If you judge him tactically, fine. If you think that really he has no much uh, direction or power outside of what happens on the football pitch, absolutely fine. If you think he struggles a little bit with his English, absolutely fine. But let's not go back into that cartoonish xenophobic uh, thing about, you know, that, you know, because he comes from another country suddenly and he has an accent, suddenly he is incapable of doing a job. That's that. I just wanted to put it out there because it really pisses me off uh, (laughs) most of the time. Let's go back to Emery and this potential. First of all, unbelievable. I do want to say a few things and ask you, James, because, you know, you know him well, obviously from his Arsenal days, you know, you, it's, he's, an, he's an interesting manager because you look at the things that he has achieved, which is quite remarkable, specifically, obviously, with either Europa League and winning, you know, so many trophies there as well. He won, you know, uh, with PSG as well, you know, a few titles as well. The runner-up with Arsenal well, didn't win it, but, you know, runner-up. But Thanks. with Villarreal right now, who they spent the most money ever, I think, in this time, and now they're not doing well in La Liga at all. So I'm wondering, are Villarreal annoyed behind this behind the scenes things, but secretly happy because they think that maybe it's not working out? Is that why it's becoming so much easier? And they'll get compensation as well. Yeah, six million pounds, I believe, in compensation. I mean, I can't speak for Villarreal's assessment. I can certainly say that I've seen this situation happen before in Unai Emery's second season. And right. when you look at the results, when you look at the quality of players, they shouldn't be 13th in La Liga. Um, you know, they're a very good team. And actually take the Europa League out of the equation. And that was fantastic and a real special moment for a small town club like Villarreal. And they did it the hard way in the end uh, after some fairly easy earlier rounds. You know, take that out of the equation. And he did take them from fifth in La Liga to seventh. It, it, the Europa League matters a lot. It was great. It got them in the Champions League and a great achievement for, a, as I say, for a smaller town club. But, you know, the league form is is not really there. Um, it is the, kind of for that reason, it is curious seeing him take over at a club where the absolute priority right now is league form. Now, Emery is perfectly happy, I think, to to do these sort of things that will be required to keep Newcastle up, drill a defence, keep things tight, 
When are, when Newcastle go one or two nil up, close up shop. See if you can hold on to the points. And he's very good at that. He's very his teams are very hard to beat when you know that you got your hands on on the on the wheel, yeah. right? Like that that is something good. But this is Newcastle. This mm. is not, right. It's not even a mid table team. This is a ta- this is a team that really looks dreary. And he has no experience of well, fifteen years I think since he's been in a relegation battle. He. <laughs> I think so it's very important. I mean, Luis, you made a really fantastic point on, on his communication. And there was quite a bit of cruelty, I thought, from Arsenal fans in the final weeks of his time there. Um, and I don't think that was fair because whatever you thought of him, he he did, he worked incredibly hard. In fact, a lot of people I spoke to when he left said the problem was he was working too hard. He was locked up in his office, talking to his coaches, trying to come up with anything that would oh, change things. That's a good point. Yeah. Equally, it is important to remember that, you know, if you are managing people, there is nothing more important than your your ability to communicate messages. And that was a huge problem for Unai Emery. It was a problem that kind of a lot of the players did not know what he wanted from them. His his methods of communication could sometimes come across as a bit panicked. Mm. His English, I mean, fundamentally, it is absolutely true to say that his English was far better than... Um, most footballers and most English people Spanish. Right. Exactly. (laughs) Most English people don't go and take a job in Spain that requires them to be the sort of face of a club. He will also, I do believe he will struggle as a sort of lone leader at Newcastle. You know, he has. That's the key. That's the key. I think that needs a director of football. I remember a very good piece by Sid Lowe on the Guardian about the fact that there was just a detachment of a relationship with Arsenal and Unai Emery. And it happens, it happens. And, and Unai Emery can come into Newcastle and completely turn it around. But I think it's going to take more, it's going to take two to tango. It's going to take a Newcastle United side who is completely not just willing to help him in every way it can, because you didn't tweet something very important as well about the fact that he's, he's very focused, as you mentioned, stuck in his office, just trying to figure out tactically, right? Formation-wise, uh, opponent-wise, training-wise, that's really where he really excels. Anything outside of that becomes a little bit of a problem. So he's going to need that help. That's why a director of football for Newcastle is just as important as the manager to make sure that he that he gets that. So go ahead, James. I know that you got a great story on that. Yeah, I mean, it was very interesting. Is is when you kind of come into a Premier League club in particular, more so I think than European clubs, you are the the face of the organization, you know, we, we do, of course, there are a growing number of directors of football, technical directors in the Premier League, but they don't, you know, they don't talk like they do in Germany or like they do in Spain or mm. even France, you know, you will hear from the manager and that's it. And I don't think that was something Unai Emery particularly appreciated at Arsenal. And there's lots of examples, big and small about this. I remember when he stripped Granite Jack of the captaincy, I remember being in that press conference and he just sort of dropped it in passing. And we were like, what? But the, for me, the perfect example was um, every year Arsenal host a sort of charity match day where all the proceeds and the players donate their wages to charity. Great initiative, really important. The sort of thing that you as a club want to make a bit of a, build, a, a big thing about in the build up to the game. So I was in his press conference. I think it was Everton. Let's say it was Everton pre-match. And uh the Arsenal club journalist says, this is the Arsenal for everyone m- match day. You know, how important do you think that is for the club, et cetera, et cetera. And Unai has not been thinking about this. He doesn't even really know much about it because it's not, you know, it's not relevant to him picking up three points. So he just goes and talks about Everton instead. And I think that's just, he is a, he is a, he would say this all the time. He's a coach. You don't ask him about transfer policy. Don't ask him about, um, you know, new contracts. That's not his job. Well, you know, just like you were saying, Luis, actually, that's your job until you guys are hire a director of football, until they get their ducks in a, in a row. I think if you were hiring Emery, you would want to drop him into a into a system you've, you've built to get the best out of him. I mean, yeah. and we that's, can- that's a very good point and one that comes more as a note as opposed to criticism because we still don't mm. know. But Newcastle United need direction and that takes more than just a manager on the sideline it takes a director and they need to work together so you know if this happens the very best let's see how it works out but it's going to be intriguing to see how how it works out because it's not just about the obstacles Unai Emery has to do on the pitch but January for example you mentioned that he already has a list of players that he may want 
you know, who is there to say, actually, maybe this player is probably better. For, you know what I mean? There needs to be a conversation. So it's yeah. going to be very interesting how this develops. How uh, soon do you expect an announcement this week? Yeah, I think that will be the aim. I think they will probably try to cool conversations down before Villarreal play Young Boys because that's an important game for Villarreal and there's certainly nothing guaranteed in terms of Champions League. But yeah, they want to move quickly. I mean, you, you made a very good point about January and I think a lot of these conversations will be almost happening with the owners and, you know, with the new, um, with the the Ruben brothers, with Amanda Stavely and her husband and with um, the public investment fund. Yeah. So it, it's kind of not happening at the level you would normally kind of expect a coach thing to happen. I'm really intrigued what he does in January. No doubt there will be a lot to spend. Anyone that's played football manager, I think with the new football manager game, we've all loaded up a Newcastle save. <laughs> I signed Eve Basuma, Anthony, um, Christopher and Kunku. Wow, I don't know why, but I have a feeling these players may not actually be available to Newcastle in the real I world. I was going to say, maybe you should uh, try and be the director for <laughs> some, because some good players right there. Hey, by yeah, the that... way, uh, the next game coming up for Newcastle, uh, I know uh, Des Norris, I just put you on the spot. Oh, he was ready. Look at that. What a producer we have. Brighton, not going to be easy. At home to Brentford, not going to be easy. And a tasty one here. Returning to Arsenal, Early kickoff, Arsenal hosting Newcastle on November 27. I can and then hardly on. wait. I'm, I'm actually really intrigued what atmosphere he gets at the, uh, at the Emirates because he, the reason he lost his job was that Arsenal fans just didn't really like him anymore and they didn't want to go and watch his team play football. But yeah. um, he also was a, he, he kind of always tried to do things in the right way. He understood the, the values of the club and tried to. It was tough. You know, it goes back to that communication issue. But, uh, I hope he gets a nice reception. I don't know if he will, but I, I hope he at least gets a warm round of applause because I think he would appreciate that. I know he left with a lot of affection for Arsenal yeah. and signed off in the right way. Yeah, well, me too. I hope that he gets a good reception, but more importantly, uh, when Una Emery comes, and Antonio Conte as well, you know, it's uh, probably in a good timing as the international break comes. He'll probably have a little bit more time to work together. That's James Bench from Kegolasso. Don't forget to check out all his great work on cbsports.com. Follow him on Twitter, James Bench. Final thoughts before we say goodbye as a busy managerial rotational circus continues. Uh, I hate to say it, but I'm wondering who Newcastle will pick up in the championship next season. You think so, regardless of that? Oh, I feel it's like, tough. yeah, I just... Be yeah, I, I know that I said final thoughts, but just one thing here. It's true, because in January, who... I'm sure you have all the money in the world, but who are you? Who's leaving for you know a, a key massive star player who's probably in a team that's already fighting in Europe, etc., or uh, with the dreams of Europe for the next season? Why would you come to Newcastle unless you're being offered just stupid money? Which you know, and again, it's not the right initiative, is it? Yeah, I think that's it. And you don't want to get in the habit of just being a place pl pay players go because they're just there for the paycheck. Oh, I don't, I really don't know who you go out and get because also, I mean, and this is the challenge Emery's going to have is he's going to have to now manage defensive, keep us up football, but also prove that come next year, if they stay up, if there's money, he's the one you can trust with that money. This is a hard, hard job. And Unai Emery is a great coach, but it's my, I have a feeling and I have a fear. I really do like the guy, but I have a fear this might be too tough for him. Interesting. By the way, check out uh, our previous pod with Alan Shearer, who gave you a little transfer list of who he wants that he wants to focus on the spine, center back, center midfielder, and of course, up front, because Callum Wilson is not always 100% healthy. Luna Emery heading to Newcastle more closer than ever. And of course, Antonio Conte, already the man at Tottenham. James Bench, thank you so much, my friend. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, everybody. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Que Golazo Pod, youtube.com forward slash Que Golazo. Press that notification bell for all the episodes. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. We are on CBS Sports and your CBS Sports app. Have a great, great rest of your week. <laughs>